This is BBC Radio 4. It's four minutes past 12 and time now for Moneybox with Paul Lewis. Hello. In today's programme, Moneybox Research finds that complaining via Twitter can be a fast and effective way to get problems resolved and we reveal the best and the worst banks at responding. HMRC wants the right to dip into our bank accounts to recover money it says we owe. Is that a step too far? And does the law stop a bank taking overdraft charges out of an account if the only money that's gone in is from welfare and child benefits? But first, every day, nearly 15,000 of us complain about financial services. That's 5.3 million complaints a year. More than half of them are upheld by the firm concerned. Most are sorted within eight weeks. £5 billion is paid in redress. But people still get frustrated about how they're treated and how long the process takes. So can you get a quicker response by complaining on Twitter? A couple of weeks ago, I asked that question to the people who follow my Twitter account. I was overwhelmed with replies, and most of them were positive. Here's just a few, set to some Vivaldi hold music. Twitter for complaining is great. Used it four times in the last three months, and three times got almost instant result. Great Twitter responses from Barclaycard this week, BT Care and O2, who fixed issues Mumbai incapable of handling. NatWest helped sort out fraud issue in minutes, and Southern Rail put heating on train. NPower helped resolve my issue very quickly. Email wasn't answered, and phoning told me that the holding time was 25 minutes. Very effective. Helped a friend's mum get a £600 gas bill refund after she went into a care home. She'd tried for months. I had issues with energy company and a large retail store. All sorted through Twitter. Power to the people. So, Vivaldi doing a bit of tweeting there, I think. Does Twitter give power to the people? David Schneider's a comedian, self-confessed Twitter obsessive, and runs a social media consultancy, thatlot.co.uk. He certainly thinks it does. If you're 29th in the queue on a phone call, only you know that. It's you and the person who's keeping you on hold. But if you tweet, it's public and it could be picked up. And I think companies are very aware that uh, it focuses the mind, doesn't it? We've certainly had tweets from people saying they got instant action. There was one lady on a train and the heating wasn't on and she tweeted about it. <laughs> yeah. Somehow the message got to head office and back to the train and the heating went on. It's quite extraordinary. But that is a wonderful story. That's why when everyone says, oh, Twitter's just the people showing their food and dull stuff, the real excitement of it is that you can get real-time results. What other medium would allow that to happen? Brands that do it well... Um, do it very well. I, mean, I remember there was a time where there was an outage on O2 on the network and uh, they were getting a hell of a lot of bad press and people were tweeting very aggressively at the O2 account and about O2 it was trending. Um, but they happened to have a very skillful, self-deprecating, humorous person on their Twitter feed at that time who uh, dealt with the abuse in a very amusing um, way. Well, I mean, I remember reading one which I couldn't share in, uh, on, on Radio 4, but uh, where it was impugning his relationship with his mother and how close they were. And he hand he said, you know, I haven't seen my mother for a while, but I completely understand why you're uh, annoyed we're trying to do something and slowly it shifted so that people were very positive people say you've got to see what's happening at o2 they're great and people went and followed so you can actually make a win out of a defeat i mean some banks we've come across and some other businesses all they do if you tweet a complaint is refer you to their helpline or say send an email that seems to me to be almost worse than saying nothing at all that's right we're very keen uh, to to tell companies that um they've got to be a human being talking to another human being uh, you know if i'm unhappy about a bank and i go onto their twitter feed and i see the same format response uh, we're sorry to hear you're having a problem please uh, contact our customer services on then i'm irritated i'm even angrier than I was whereas really it's about diffusing that anger by being a person talking to another person I mean there's some fantastic examples of that just recently uh, Argos got uh, a complaining tweet from a guy at badman bugti uh, I'll read out the tweet uh, to you it's like at Argos online yo when you getting the ps4 things in moss side ain't waiting no more plus the Asian guy who works here 
got beer attitude hashtag waste man uh, so uh, what argos did was then they replied in that colloquial manner i, I mean f- forgive my accent but they they said uh, to Ad- Adman bugsy safe bad man we getting some more ps4 things in within the next week you get me so's about the attitude probs having a bad day yo um and the whole point the that went so viral because it was a company saying right we've had this complaint let's not just go please we're sorry to hear that so please contact customer services they complained as a human being with a sense of humor and that was a big win for them (laughs) david schneider playing several parts there well we've done our own research into how banks respond to tweets and a new voice on moneybox hannah moore has been watching the banks watching you on twitter hannah I monitored the Twitter feeds of eight of the major banks, Lloyds, HSBC, RBS, NatWest, Ulster Bank, Nationwide, Barclays and Santander for one working day this week. I wanted to find out how long it took each bank to respond to their customers. And which bank was fastest? Nationwide were the speediest. They took an average of 10 minutes to respond. In fact, four of the banks were responding to customers in 20 minutes or less, NatWest, Lloyds and HSBC. But at the other end of the scale, Santander took almost five hours on average to respond, just ahead of RBS, which took about four hours. I noticed differences in staffing levels and hours of operation. Nationwide is monitoring its Twitter feed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but Santander's is only being checked during business hours, Monday to Friday. Now, speed's obviously important, but how helpful were the responses customers received? Well, I have to say, I didn't see many problems being solved on Twitter, but it certainly does help push your request to the front of the queue. When customers complained about hanging on premium rate phone lines, HSBC and Nationwide staff promised to call them instead. And if you're confused about which department you need to get in touch with, Twitter's really helpful. The best banks provided the correct phone numbers, forms and web links within minutes, again saving you time on an 0845 number. But Barclays, who took almost three hours on average, I did notice, were doing little more than saying sorry to their customers. Thanks, Hannah. And just in, an email from Dan says, I used Twitter to complain to my bank last week regarding a community account. It had been with the Ombudsman for five months, sorted by Twitter in six days. Now let's go live now to Southampton to talk to Joe Corzen, who's Chief Executive of the Institute of Customer Service. Um, Joe Corzen, is Twitter the best new way to get results? Well, good morning, Paul. I mean, certainly, having listened uh, uh, to uh, the recent uh, views, today's customers are certainly far more savvy, much more discerning, and expect organisations to relate to them as individuals and not as transactions. And what I would say is I would hope that organisations have a whole range of different channels in order to be able to communicate, and therefore choosing the right channel for the complaint, I believe, is very important. A banking problem in itself doesn't necessarily lend itself to a very public place like Twitter. So I think it's about the nature of the problem and what you're looking to have resolved. But do you think uh, that uh, companies are going to have to get ready to respond to Twitter in bigger numbers. I mean, our, sh- our survey showed wide variation. The number actually complaining very by a Twitter is very few out of the five million a year. But it, in the future, it's going to grow. So they've got to take it more seriously. And I would certainly agree with that, Paul. And indeed, Institute research would uh, mirror what you've just said. So a lot of us at the moment are not complaining necessarily through Twitter. But as we uh, progress, it certainly is a medium of choice and organisation will need to be able to uh, respond appropriately. And how good are financial firms generally at at what we might call customer satisfaction compared with other retail firms? So if I look at, uh, the Institute does something called the UK Customer Satisfaction Index and we measure customer satisfaction across the whole of the UK, across 13 different industry sectors and we have over 12,000 responses in that particular index and what we see is that the top performing sectors in terms of customer satisfaction are the retail sectors, closely followed by automotive, services and leisure. 
banking and building societies are around about mid-table, and then towards the end of the table we'll find things like telecommunications, utilities and transport. And people have been tweeting me this morning saying it's also a good way to give positive feedback, so it can actually be something good for firms as well as just responding to a complaint. Absolutely. I mean, one of the key things that we're seeing in the, in the changing world that we're all living in is that we want to have better dialogue, not just about monologue with our organisations. So opening up channels to increase better dialogue has only got to be a good thing. Joe Corson of the Institute of Customer Service, thanks. And if you want to use Twitter to make a complaint, I've tweeted a link to my handy five-point guide. Questions about complaints to financial services firms via any medium, call Moneybox Live on Wednesday afternoon this week with Leslie Kerwin. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs wants the power to dip into our bank accounts to settle unpaid tax bills. Under the plans announced in the budget but published in detail this week, the revenue would take the money without going to court if we owed at least £1,000 and it had tried other methods to recover it. It wants to be able to raid not just a current account but savings accounts and ISAs as well. It could even go in for half the money in a joint account. The revenue says it could affect 17,000 people a year and bring in nearly a hundred million pounds and defends the plan by saying a typical tax debtor owes just under six thousand pounds but has twenty thousand pounds in savings to pay it from there was a mixed reaction though from our listeners people should pay what they owe most on modest incomes have no choice as it all gets taken through paye hmrc make too many errors if they got it right every time or even 99 percent of the time then fine I've had six tax codes in one year. If they've tried to get you to pay it voluntarily and you haven't, why not? This is a very small group of people owing small amounts of money. HMRC should be going for the big avoiders and the big evaders. But MPs on the Treasury Select Committee want more safeguards before the revenue is allowed to help itself to our money without going to court. Andrew Tyree is the committee's chair. He recognises that HMRC has to get the tax we owe, but he's concerned at the new powers it's demanding. HMRC already has the power to take legal possession of goods when a taxpayer has payments outstanding, but that requires a court order. What we're being asked to consider here by the government is something without that, wherein the money can be collected without a court order directly from a bank account. Now, already the government have announced some safeguards with respect to it that a minimum of £5,000 will be left in the account and that taxpayers must have been contacted at least four times prior to the money being taken. But we need to be absolutely sure before such a draconian power is given to HMRC, and we've made a number of proposals, the most important of which is that there must be some form of prior independent oversight. If it's not going to be a court, there must be something perhaps some kind of ombudsman type service or tribunal rather than just go straight into someone's account. It does seem a bit arbitrary without some protection. Andrew Tyree of the Treasury Select Committee. Adrian Houston is a director of tax consultants Houston & Co in Belfast and a former tax inspector himself. I asked him if the revenue needed these extra powers. Yes, Paul, I think they do. Uh, they, they spend a vast amount of time and our money chasing those people who don't pay their taxes on time and these uh, these special measures are coming in only for those people who have substantial tax debts and who have money in the bank in other words they're holding back on paying it but most people when they want to collect money go through the normal channels which is you go to court you prove the debt and the court enforces it why can't hmrc do that like the rest of us have to well, they do do it, but the thing is there are so many people who are leaving HMRC to be the last person to get their money. They're thinking, oh, well, I'll go on my holiday, I'll change the car, I'll clear my credit card debts. HMRC is only charging me 3%, so I'll put them to the back of the queue. Well, also with us is Elaine Clark. She's Managing Director of CheapAccounting.co.uk and also an accountant herself. Uh, Elaine Clark, how different are these new powers from the ones that exist already? Well, HMRC already have a lot of powers to, to go in and recover the debts from people that aren't paying tax. I fundamentally disagree with HMRC having access to anybody's bank account. I think this is a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It relates to 0.2% of taxpayers, and I think the powers are excessive and disproportional to the problem that's being solved. 
people on average owe £5,800, the people they're concerned about, and half of them have £20,000 in the bank. So why shouldn't they pay their tax? Well, they should, but we've got laws in this land which say the way to go about recovering money from somebody's bank account is to take it to the court. The thing that I would question, and as an accountant we see it quite often, is the ineffective methods that HMRC use to recover debts. Maybe they should be going to the courts earlier. I don't want tax officers spending a fortune of my tax dollars in chasing people and threatening court action, going through what is a very expensive and cumbersome process to, to use the courts. We also don't want the courts overloaded because it's a simple matter of somebody who has got thousands of pounds in the bank. If they've less than £5,000 in the bank, they have nothing to fear. They have thousands of pounds in the bank and yet they aren't paying their tax bills. How, do, how will HMRC know that these people have got thousands of pounds in the bank and how would they know what bank accounts that they've got? Maybe I've given HMRC my bank account details in the past for purposes of getting a tax refund. Is that information then going to be held and used to recover tax in the future? There's every chance that that is the case, Elaine, um, but I, I don't think that... Well, then uh, I should have thought it would discourage people from ever giving HMRC a bank account. To my mind, if somebody then knows they're not going to go through the court, but they're going to use this new process, they'll shift their money around anyway before HMRC are able to access it. This is your advice as an accountant, is it, Elaine? Shift your money and don't put your bank account details on your self-assessment form, as most people do. I would have to say my advice as an accountant would be not to provide your bank account details to HMRC for fear that in future you could have money taken out of the bank account. We heard Andrew Tyree there saying that he thought these powers were, um, were very strong and that there should be some independent oversight, maybe a special ombudsman just to deal with these powers to dip into our bank accounts. Do you think that's necessary? I, I think it sounds a little bit disproportionate. We have an adjudicator to look after tax matters. We all have the right to complain to our MP if HMRC has behaved badly, and I heartily recommend that process to your listeners. And I don't think we need another layer of bureaucracy here. There are a lot of safeguards, and this is only a measure that HMRC will, will engage if they have engaged with person a lot of times, maybe six, seven, eight, nine reminders, and the person has refused to pay and also refused to negotiate about things. Among these proposals is a reduction in the time people have to appeal against a decision. At the moment, it's 30 days. It's going to be just 14 calendar days from the date the letter was issued, which could leave you with a week or less than a fortnight. You might be away. Is, is that too short a time? Yes, Paul, I, I would think that is too short a time because I, I spend my days dealing with HMRC letters that uh, they post out on the 1st of April. They arrive on the 15th of April and they demand a response by the 17th and things like that. So I think 30 days is not unreasonable. 14 days isn't long enough. It seems to be outside of, of what is the standard allowable time. It needs to be extended on that. That is part of the consultation and hopefully if these proposals ever get light of day, will be extended. It. Elaine Clark of Chief Accounting and Adrian Houston. And we did ask HMRC and the Treasury to explain their plans. They both said no. But you can tell HMRC what you think. The consultation runs until 29th of July. Link on our website. Some of you are telling us. Chris says, do you think HMRC will be reaching into Amazon's or Starbucks bank accounts? And Steve Harris uh, tweeted to say the trouble is HMRC has a woeful record in accuracy. They fine us if a day late, but we have no comeback.